Please welcome Matan Berkowitz. Hey, my name is Matan, and I'm here to speak about music technology, which is what I do and what I love. And it's also a pretty big subject, because if you think about it, music technology could just as easily mean a synthesizer application for a tablet as it does uh, an ancient instrument, aboriginal acoustic instrument like the didgeridoo. <laughs> Music technology. <laughs> so if you think about it, we have not a lot of time and we should focus, right? So I want to bring to the table the four aspects that I've been kind of researching and, and focusing on myself and speak about them specifically. So the first one will be the physical element of music technology, how technology could make music a more physical experience. The second one will be wearable, wearable aspect of music as expressed through technology. The third one will be the visual aspect, how can technology visualize music in new and exciting ways. And the fourth one will be the accessibility. How can technology make music accessible to as many people as possible? So I'd like to start with the physical aspect. All right, so I've been basically developing prototypes for music technology, and the first thing that I felt drawn to was this physical translation of our body, our movement, uh, to music. And I made the distinction between the physical and voluntary actions that we make, like moving our heads and using our voice or being Obama, uh, to the biological uh, involuntary actions that our body performs all by itself and we can't really do that much to interfere with, like our heartbeat or our brain activity. And as musicians, if we think about these two things, they're very different because the first one could be played and used as an instrument. We can try and play our body as an instrument and express ourselves. The second one, however, is more of a feedback kind of experience where the body is playing itself. So you not, you're not really playing music as much as music is playing you. And I think this is best demonstrated uh, for me uh, in my experience with EEG, which is basically electrical activity in the brain. And I've been working with uh, an Israeli company called Neurosteer uh, with two uh, amazing people, uh, Professor Nathan Shredder and Lenny Riedel. They, they developed a um, system that translates this electrical activity in the brain into, you could say, uh, basically data, cognitive data. And then I was taking this data that the EEG was giving and translating that to musical values. So you'll end up taking electrical activity in your brain and turning it into melodies. You're not really playing the melodies, you're not choosing the notes, but it's live feedback to what you're experiencing, what your body is doing at the time. And we'll come back to this soon. But before, let's move on to the wearable aspect. So as I said, I've been working on, on different prototypes and this kind of junction between the physical and biological aspects of our bodies and the wearable kind of uh, phenomenon that's been going on in the technology world have been really fascinating for me. I started with uh, this hat, for example, which is a musical hat. It has three main features, which is buttons, so you can loop yourself and control the hat. And it has a gyroscope, which means you can trace your head movements and use that to make music. But it also has the EEG uh, musical reader inside the hat. So this is a combination of being able to actually control music using this technology and also allowing the instrument to play you instead of you playing the instrument. Another example of this would be this glove which is obviously a prototype. <laughs> and what it does is translate your heartbeat. It translates the pulse into music. Again, this is involuntary. Your heart will beat anyhow. Why not make it into music? The third aspect is the visual aspect. And this is our first demo as well. So there's a lot of uh, different ways to visualize music, to give it form. But I think one of the most interesting ways is called semantics. Semantics is actually a physical phenomenon. Um, it's not digital and it's not uh, graphic. It's more of a physical um, vibration 
that you can see when playing music and sound through water or sand. Certain types of materials respond to vibrations by showing us what they look like. And this, for example, which we also have right here, uh, is a plate. When you put sand on this plate and you basically uh, play the vibrations through the plate, it forms geometrical patterns to mirror the music. And we're going to demonstrate this live because we have with us today the good people of Healing Music, which is an Israeli company that specializes in semantics. And they have their own technology here to show us on the screen of what this looks like. So we're going to play different uh, frequencies through this plate. The first frequency will be 440 hertz. Let's see what it looks like on the plate. As you can see, the sand is taking a form, a geometrical pattern to match the vibration. But 430 is an asymmetrical vibration when it comes to semantics. Let's look at 528 hertz and see what that looks like. This looks nicer. But now let's switch it up and go to 963 hertz. So this is just sand responding to vibration. But it's visualizing music and it's visualizing frequency in a totally different way than we're used to thinking about it. All right, let's go back to the presentation for a second. Can you give a hand to Healing Music? Thank you. All right, so we're left with the accessible aspect of music technology. And for me, this is a very personal uh, part of the process because this is what I've been devoting most of my time and energy to for the past six months or so. I call it very creatively the music accessibility pyramid. <laughs> and at the top of this pyramid, there are professionals, uh, professional musicians who have the knowledge and the technique and expensive gear. And, you know, they just do whatever they want with whatever they have. But then there's like hobbyists and amateurs. They also have gear and technology, maybe they have bands and albums, uh, and they use whatever they can uh, afford, whatever they want to use to express themselves. But below them are non-musicians who feel like, all right, music is not as accessible for me as for other people I haven't started playing when I was young. By the way, if you think this, you should just start playing. If you want to play, you can play at any age. Because if we think about the next step of this pyramid, the base of the pyramid, which we often kind of ignore. There's a whole layer of special needs. People with special needs have a totally different set of challenges when they come to playing music, when they try to approach an instrument. Even if you've never played in your life, if you really want to play the guitar or jam on a drum kit, it's not that complicated. You can start learning, you can experiment. But for some people, this becomes a very, very difficult experience, very challenging. And what we started thinking about was if we connect these two dots, if we connect these two layers, the top and the bottom, if we bring professional musicians who are also people with disabilities and we work with them and we develop prototypes and inventions that allow them to play and express themselves freely, this will probably affect the entire pyramid. This will affect the entire structure. Because if you can play music, regardless of your limitations, then obviously hobbyists and people who've never played will have a much easier time as well. What we did was a first-of-its-kind event called Discotech, which was a hackathon devoted to music technology for special needs. It was two days, but it was four months of preparation in collaboration with um, an Israeli NPO called Imagine, which, founded, which was founded with the mission of making music accessible for the special needs population, and my own company, Shift, which specializes in innovation for positive impact. And together, we assembled teams of developers and makers and designers and just brilliant people. And these people came together around four different musicians with four different challenges. And they worked on creating prototypes that would allow them to play. After this amazing event, I spent a month and a half working on a video to describe the experience. And I'd like to show it to you.
for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. 